Welcome to today's YouTube service. It's good to see you. Hope that you've had a good week where you've known the, the presence of the Lord. If you would like to join us at Mount Elim uh, in the church building, you're welcome to do so. It would be great to see you. We meet at 10.30 and 6 o'clock on Sundays. If you're not able to come, then we hope that this video will be a blessing to you and encouragement. We also meet now uh, in the evening and we have a Zoom live stream uh, of the evening service. Uh, if you like the details for that, then do get in touch with me. Steph.Jones1980 at gmail.com It would be great to hear from you anyway, particularly if you haven't been in touch before, uh, just to find out more about you and to get to know you better. There are some meetings happening in the church during the week. We've got Club Ponte and Impact on Tuesdays, Busy Bees on Thursdays, and then on Wednesday, uh, the prayer meeting continues on Zoom at 7 o'clock. Next Saturday, uh, there's a special event. Uh, there's a harvest fun evening for people of all ages, for the whole church, at 5.30 on Zoom. Pete and Pat are going to do that. I'm sure it'll be a great event. It was a highlight last year. Again, get in touch if you'd like details about that. And then next Sunday, I'll be preaching in the morning and the evening once again. Well, let us listen or sing along to our first hymn together.
A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by his, on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine, mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Thanks for the reading. It's good to pause and to reflect and consider what we've thought about already. This is now the sixth part in this series, Why I Am a Christian. We started off with God's grace and power that someone becomes a Christian as they are born again by the Spirit. God begins the work in a person's heart. Then we thought about the word of God, that God speaks. We need to know more than anything else in this world who God is and how we can know God, how we can have peace with God and experience his presence in our lives. And the Bible tells us he speaks to us. In the Bible, this is his word. And he shows us the way of salvation, how we can know him, how we can have a relationship with him, how we can have eternal life. He's communicated these things. He wants to know us. We thought about God's glory and holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. As we think about God, as we read the way he is revealed to us in the Bible, we see that he is worthy of worship, adoration, honour, praise and glory, uh, that this fuels our worship. But it also humbles us that there should be a sense of reverent fear and respect. And as we see the holiness of God, we become aware of our sinfulness and so the need for God in our lives, the need for God to forgive us, the need for God to deliver us and to save us. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. And as we saw in the last session, the eternity of God, there is an existence, there is a conscious existence after the life here in this world. There is a heaven, there is a hell, and we are all going to hell by nature. We are all deserving of God's judgment and condemnation. And so we need God's love, we need God's grace. And so this is where we finish last time, this humbling, this awareness that we need God's grace in our lives. I hope and pray that you've been given a big view of God, the God who exists 
the God who is the creator, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who is sovereign over all of creation, the one who is the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the one who is all-knowing, the one who is all-present, the one who is holy and perfect and righteous in every way. I hope that you've experienced something of the glory of God that your mind has been expanded as you've seen something of how great and, and wondrous God is. But I also hope and pray that there's been a humbling, that alongside the wonder at the holiness and the sovereignty and glory of God, that you've also become aware of your own sin. It is often the first response to God, that sense of wonder, that humbles us, aware of our weakness, aware of our sin, aware of our mortality even. And this happens again and again and again throughout the Bible. As they see the glory of God, they are flawed. They become mute. Right up to the New Testament, the angels appear, as we'll be thinking of the next few months as we come to Christmas. The angels appear. And they worship and praise the glory of God. And the shepherds are terrified. I wonder if you experienced this over the last few weeks. Have you experienced it in your life? Romans 3.23 All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you know that? Do you believe that you've fallen short of God's glory? Hebrews 9 verse 27 We are all destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Do you believe this in your mind, in your heart? Ecclesiastes said we're going to begin a series uh, in Ecclesiastes tonight on Sunday evenings. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 4, a wise person thinks about death. I know many of you have been affected by Ray's sad and sudden demise and this made many of us real, realise the brevity and uh, the, uh, the, the f- how fragile life is. And yeah, it's been difficult, doesn't it, for, for many of us? James 4, verse 15. What is your life? A mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. The outlook is bleak, really. Uh, if you think of Romans uh, chapter 3, as we saw. Uh, a couple of sessions ago, Romans 3 uh, verses 11, 24, uh, the assessment of humanity. Uh, there is no one who understands, no one who is righteous, not even one, no one who seeks God. All have turned away, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. And then verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so our prospects are bleak. We are standing at the precipice of eternity and we are not facing life or blessing or glory as we are, we're facing God's judgment. Jesus said that the seed must die before it produces fruit. I think of pruning a tree that you cut back the tree, that you have to cut down the branches before it can grow again and blossom. You think of the new church building at Mount Elim, God willing. Well, the old site will be demolished before the new site can be built up. And the same thing is true spiritually, that we must be humbled, that we must be brought low, that we must become aware of our sinfulness, aware of our need before we understand the good news of the Lord Jesus. And so can I encourage you to look at your life as God sees your life, to ask God to help to search your heart and to examine yourself. A life unexamined is not worth living, and so it's good to examine your life. Well, where do we go then when we become aware of these things? Well, we turn to Romans chapter 3, and the very next verse, verses 24 uh, and then into 25. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement 
through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. There are two significant words uh, in Romans 3.24 and they evoke imagery, justified and redemption. They both come from particular contexts. Justified, first of all, to be justified, justification. It's associated with the law courts. It's a legal term. To be justified, in essence, is to be declared not guilty, no longer facing punishment, no longer under condemnation, no longer in the dock, but being set free. Not having to suffer, not having to pay a price, not facing a penalty. Romans 3 verses 11 to 23, as we've seen, show just how guilty we all are by nature. We stand condemned. But the good news is that we can be justified. We can be declared not guilty. We can be declared blameless, holy, as if we never sinned. This is how God sees Christians. This is how God considers us. If we've trusted in the Lord Jesus, we are justified. And even more than that, we are considered righteous. We are given the righteousness of Jesus. Remember at Jesus' baptism, uh, the words were heard from heaven, the words of God the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He had lived a perfect and righteous life. And to be justified is to be told you are no longer guilty. Your sins are not counted against you anymore. You are not under condemnation. But the gospel goes even further than that. And we are sanctified. We are made righteous so that God looks at us. He sees us in his love, in his grace and through the Lord Jesus as righteous. Clothed in Jesus' righteousness. So that he can say not only about Jesus, but he can say about every Christian, this is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. A wonderful, wonderful comfort that God thinks this about you. That he does not hold you to account anymore and that he will not judge you. He will not punish you. There will be no penalty to pay because you are justified. And then the second word is redemption. And this comes from uh, the marketplace and specifically the slave trade. Thinking of Roman times. But we can also go even further than that and to the period of the Exodus. Just before then, of course, the, uh, the, the Israelites were enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt. They were not free. Uh, they were oppressed. They were cruelly treated. They were slaves in Egypt. But they were set free, just as a slave can be set free. This is the idea here, that a, a slave is set free, that someone pays in order to release them. The Israelites were set free. They were redeemed from slavery. And a slave might be set free if someone kindly pays to set them free. Well, we are enslaved to sin. We see that very clearly later on in the remaining chapters of Romans. That we are enslaved to sin by nature, that we cannot but sin. It is within us, this sin, this selfishness. So often we have good plans and we have good intentions. But have you experienced that? That the sin and the selfishness gets in the way? Martin Luther called it a straitjacket. Uh, that uh, binds us. Others have called it the bias in a bowl's ball. Uh, that ultimately sin always leads us astray. And again, we've seen this in Romans 3. Well, the good news is that we can be set free. The good news of the Lord Jesus, the gospel, is that Jesus sets us free from sin. He sets us free from the penalty of sin. We are no longer condemned we're no longer uh, considered sinners in God's eyes but we are justified we are set free declared not guilty we are also set free from the power of sin as the Holy Spirit comes and lives in the Christian's life you can now sing no to temptation you now have a, a, a heavenly Holy Spirit living within you God's power so that you can live a pure 
and an ungodly moral life for the glory of God. So this is wonderful news. These two words here, justified, not guilty, not under condemnation, redeemed, set free from the penalty and the power of sin. Sin has no hold of you anymore. Wonderful verses. The sixth reason I'm a Christian is because of the cross of Christ. We see in these verses that we are justified and we are redeemed freely. How? Well, by Christ Jesus. How? Well, verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, as propitiation through the shedding of his blood. That Jesus died for our sin. That Jesus took my sin away. And that everyone and anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus can have their sins forgiven. That they can be justified. That they can be redeemed. That they can become a child of God. This is a free gift. The greatest gift you could be given. To know freedom from sin and guilt. And because of that there are no obstacles now between you and God. You can have a relationship with God. He can be your father in heaven. And one day you can access his dwelling place you'll be able to go to heaven and enjoy his presence and see the lord jesus face to face forever and ever i'm a christian for a variety of reasons but the two most significant reasons are the first the grace of god the power of the spirit giving me life and then today's point the death of the lord jesus he died for my sins and this is the basis of all my hope and all my joy and certainty and assurance. We've seen two words that evoke imagery that help us to understand the significance of Jesus' death. We thought of redemption, we thought of justification. I now want to go to the Gospels, to Mark's Gospel, the reading that we heard earlier, Mark chapter 15, but also we'll turn to Mark 14 as well. Because in these chapters, we read about Jesus' death. And there are images here, pictures, that help us to understand the significance and the power of Jesus' death. It's interesting that in the Gospels, we haven't got theological treaties. We haven't got theological discussion or discourse helping us to understand why Jesus died. Those come later in the epistles, such as Romans. What we have in the Gospels are echoes, pictures, symbols that take us back to the Old Testament. And these help us to understand why Jesus died and why Jesus' death was actually the most significant and greatest event in the whole of human history. And I think you have to put the death and the resurrection together. The death and the resurrection together, the greatest uh, most important events in the whole of of this world. The first image is found in Mark chapter 14 and it's a cup. Uh, in this chapter we read about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he is full of sorrow and anguish. Uh, he feels such sorrow even to the point of death. You remember that he sweats drops of blood, that he is facing this torment and this anguish. Deeply distressed, he falls to the ground. Why is he so troubled? What causes this distress? Why does the Lord Jesus respond in this way? Is it fear of death? He knows that he's going to die. He knows that this is God's will for him. Is it a fear of death? I don't think so. Some of his followers in centuries to come would suffer terribly gruesome death themselves. And yet they would be given such resolve. You think of Hugh Latimer turning to Master Ridley, play the man, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. Courage, resolution, resolved to do God's will, even that, if that means suffering and dying. 
Well, if they were able to have such resolve, I believe that the Lord Jesus had such resolve as well. I don't think it's fear of death in itself. I don't think it's fear of being betrayed by one of his closest friends or even being abandoned by all of his disciples apart from John. I don't think that's what it is. I think there is something deeper here. What is it? Well, in Mark 14, there's a reference to the cup. There in Gethsemane, he prays to God the Father, take this cup from me. It is this cup that fills him with dread. It is not the thought of the death itself, but it's this cup that he knows that he must drink. And as he thinks about this cup, it fills him with horror. This is what causes him distress and trouble, the thought that he will have to drink from a cup. Well, what is this cup? Well, there are many cups in the Old Testament. Psalm 23 uh, is a cup that overflows with grace. We know in other places of a cup of salvation. There is also a cup of wrath in Jeremiah 25, verse 15, in Isaiah 51, verse 17. And this is the cup that Jesus will have to drink on the cross. He knows that on the cross, he will face and he will endure the wrath of God. And he will have to drink that cup until it is empty because he will be bearing the wrath of the world to his people. He was innocent. He was righteous. He had no sins himself. He did nothing to, uh, to deserve God's or to demand God's wrath. He was pure and good in every way. But on the cross, he voluntarily took our place. Willingly, he went and endured the wrath of God, drank that cup so that we would not have to drink from that cup. He drank the cup of wrath dry so that we can drink the cup of salvation that overflows with grace. The second image uh, is the cross itself. The cross it's probably the most brutal of all forms of, of execution. The word excruciating comes from crucifixion. It was a taboo uh, in Jewish culture, and I think even in Roman culture, uh, that children were not meant to hear about the cross, about crucifixion, because it was such a barbaric form of death. And it was reserved really for the lowest of the low. And not even the Roman citizens could die in this way. It, uh, its purpose was to spread terror in the hearts of the citizens, a frightening deterrent, a public spectacle. And yet for the Jews, it was even more horrific. There's a verse in Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's wrath. The cross was physical torture, agony, and yet the most significant thing that happened on the cross was that he was cursed. The curse, the judgment, the condemnation of God was upon him. Again, here is the righteous one. Here's the one who had lived a holy life, but an exchange takes place, a swap takes place, so that he takes the death of penalty in our place. He suffers the consequences for our sins. He is cursed so that we can be blessed. And then the third picture, well, we come to what happened during Jesus' death. It's in Mark chapter 15 and verse 33, that at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three o'clock in the afternoon. Some people think that this was just an eclipse but it seems unlikely uh, because, uh, well, and it's Passover, it's full moon, uh, and solar eclipses don't happen at full moon. It was the West Spring season, uh, and so a dust storm couldn't explain it. This was something far greater and more significant, darkness over the land. This is from God. It is God who who took the light. It is God who over enveloped the land with darkness. Darkness symbolises fear. Darkness symbolises uncertainty. 
darkness also symbolizes God's judgment. Again, you think of Pharaoh. He hardens his heart and uh, there are plagues and one of them is the darkness to judge, to condemn, to awaken, to, to make Pharaoh aware of what he's done. Under uh, God's judgment and curse, Amos 8 simply talks about darkness. So darkness is a curse. We don't really understand darkness in, in our society because we're not truly dark. You have to go up to the mountains, maybe go to the Brecon Beacons to experience true darkness. I remember my grandfather telling me a story uh, in the 1960s, I think, or the 70s. Uh, he was given the job as an electrician of, of installing temporary lights uh, in Karakenen Castle so that they could ex excavate the tunnels. Uh, and he said that he had never seen such darkness. Uh, that he could not even see his hand in front of his eyes because it was just total, absolute darkness. Well, the darkness that overwhelmed the land signified the judgment of God, that the judgment of God was upon Jesus. Again, do you see the point? Jesus suffered darkness. He endured the darkness so that we can know the light of God that we can see with clear eyes hope and joy and life. And then the fourth image is found in Jesus' words. They are Aramaic words which Jesus cried out on the cross. As he died, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was happening on that cross? Well, he was drinking the cup of wrath. He was bearing the curse of God the Father. He was under judgment, the darkness of judgment. Jesus understood this. He knew that God was turning his face away from Jesus. And this is the image. God the Father turning his face away from his son why my god my god have you forsaken me that's what those uh, Ara um, aramaic words mean why have you forsaken me why have you turned your back on me he wasn't misguided he wasn't confused he had not misunderstood the situation god indeed had turned his face away from his son because the sins of the world were now upon the Jesus. In Romans 24, Romans 3 verse 24, it speaks about Jesus becoming the sacrifice of atonement, becoming a propitiation. A sacrifice is provided to take on the wrath and the judgment of God so that those uh, who trust in that sacrifice, those who place their faith in the sacrifice can be set free. And this exactly is what happened on the cross. That Jesus died in our place. That he was provided by God the Father as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus lovingly and willingly accepted that. He was willing to go and to die as that sacrifice. He was willing to drink that cup. He was willing to hang on a tree cursed by God. He was willing to suffer the darkness of God. He was willing to hear uh, and to, uh, to think of his father uh, be, uh, abandoning him and forsaking him. He was willing to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he wanted us to know and love and experience God's presence in our lives. In grace and mercy to be able to drink the cup of salvation to be able to receive the blessings of God to see the light of God and to hear God saying come draw near to me I will not forsake you I will not abandon you the sixth reason why I'm a Christian is because of the cross of Christ I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've fallen short of God's glory. I know that I deserve judgment. But I know even more powerfully that Jesus died for me on the cross. 
And so I am forgiven of all my sins. And I know that I can know God as my Father and go to heaven one day and be with him. Are you aware of your sinfulness? Maybe you feel it. Maybe there is guilt. Maybe there is sorrow. Maybe there is sadness and you're convicted of those sins and you feel condemned. Well, there's only one place you can go. There's only one place you can go to have that removed. The cross of the Lord Jesus. Look to the cross. Look to Jesus. And there's that wonderful hymn before the throne of God above when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. I pray the look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. When you're aware of your sinfulness, don't try to make up for it because there is nothing you can do. You can never be good enough. Don't try to prove that you are sorry enough or that you will try to live a better life. Cry out for mercy. Look to the cross and know that Jesus has died for sinners like you and me. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for God's mercy and you will be given life and salvation and you'll be able to drink that cup of salvation that overflows with grace. You are justified by Jesus' blood because he has taken the wrath upon himself, because he's taken the punishment, because he's paid the price, you are justified. You are not guilty. There is no condemnation. If you've trusted in Jesus, you are now free. You will not go to hell, you will go to heaven. And that is a wonderful promise in God's word. You are redeemed. You've been set free from the presence and the power and the penalty of sin. And so that gives you hope today and for tomorrow. And so as I think about why I am a Christian, at the very heart of the Christian faith is the Lord Jesus, Christ crucified. He died for my sins and because of that you and me can know forgiveness life and hope will you look to jesus today will you place your faith in him
Let's pray. God and Father, we thank you for sending your Son to be the Saviour of the world. Thank you that you love the world so much that you sent your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We thank you for those wonderful words from John 3.16. And I pray now for whoever is listening, that they might receive salvation, that they might confess their sins and turn to you, that they might realise that by trusting in Jesus they can be forgiven of all their sins and that they can have an eternal, everlasting life. Father, would you speak to the hearts of each and every one listening to this message. Be exalted in our lives. Draw near to us. In Jesus' name. Amen.